Wow, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Who else is jet lagged? Thank God for that. At least I'm not alone. I may have to step up my game now. So this is basically um, a monolithic talk about microservices. And it's a talk really about how we draw boundaries around things. And that means different things to all of us. But I think it's something, you know, it sounds like a trivial thing, but it's actually the opposite. And this is a never-ending subject in computer science, right? Uh, it extends to how we write code, uh, how we apply code, how we run code, how we make systems, even how we uh, measure the results. We, we use modules and we describe things in terms of modules, um, almost to the point that it's a doctrine. It obviously spans dev, it spans ops, uh, it's, it's uh, used by the builders, it's used by the machines, and even, heaven help us, the users are even modular in some sense. And, you know, I was thinking hard about what I was going to say. I'm coming into the den of, of people who, who, who deal with microservices and think, what, I, what could I possibly say to you guys that you wouldn't, wouldn't be just obvious, um, give you a different slant on something, perhaps? Uh, and I came up with these two, two issues, which are kind of hobby horses of mine, things that I like to come back to again and again. One is scale, and the other is knowledge. And my background, I'm trained as a, a theoretical physicist. And the meaning of scale in physics is quite different to what we think of in computer science, where scale is sort of, you know, how can we throw more resources at the problem to make it bigger or faster? Um, and I wanted to share a little bit of that perspective, what, you know, sort of a physics point of view of scale with you and what it could mean. Because I think these two challenges of knowledge and scale are the two, the two challenges for the next 20 years. These are the things that are really going to be concerning us for the next 20 years. And so I want to talk about how we distinguish things and draw boundaries around things for creative purpose and tie this into um, the idea of promise theory, which is an idea that I've been developing for the past 10, 15 years or so. I'm going to talk about a couple of modern technologies, a couple of the technologies that are sort of coming up that are relevant to this, but I want to start out with the basic ideas, the sort of the, uh, the conceptual ideas behind it and try and perhaps try to look at some of these things using some analogies that will help us to, to understand. This image on the first slide is, is particularly apt. It shows a city, and I'll come back to it, but back to cities in a minute because I think cities are going to be the model of what software will look like in the next 10, 20 years. All of the things we experience in a city, we are going to experience in software systems in 10, 20 years. So this could be the future of code, but more on that in a minute. Who knows this song? Nobody? This is a song by, yes, Machine Messiah. It's a great song. But I thought this was particularly apt for centralization. Of, and of course, there's a Cray, central Cray computer behind there, which is somehow the monolith, the classic monolith of computer science. So boundaries then. Boundaries obsess us on any number of levels in computer science. Modularity is practically doctrine in IT. We've come up with all kinds of stories about why it's good. You know, uh, efficiency, fault domains, logic, maintainability, reusability, uh, and, you know, count any number of others in that, uh, that list. Some of these, I think, are fair, and some of them are quite unconvincing to me. Um, from a physics perspective, we also talk about modularity, but in physics, we use words like locality and finite range, short range systems and long range systems. So we use different words, but have a lot of experience of the same kinds of issues that crop up in, in modular, modular systems. And in physics, there are really only quantitative things, but in IT, we also have to deal with qualitative things. So there, there are both what I call demand, dynamics and semantics, so things that change dynamically, but there are also interpretations of things and functional things in, in IT that we have to deal with that physics doesn't really like to talk about very much. And there are 
actually methods in physics for understanding modularity and even trying to understand the correct definition of what would be considered a module or, or a, a region of a system that have to do with eigenstates and eigen, eigenvalues of systems. Any, any of you guys math, mathematic, mathematicians or physicists by training? Probably, I'm sure you are, you're just shy. Uh, but these are, there are plenty of ideas around this. Um, but in the politics of tech, you know, modularity is actually quite uh, clear cut. We use tech uh, to, to, in often political ways, we think we consider it correct to define boundaries in a particular way. And the story of monoliths versus microservices, I think, is also one of those interesting stories. Years ago, when I started my company, I, I was the founder of CF Engine. CF Engine is a kind of an agent-based, totally distributed system that follows many of these principles today that you guys work with. And uh, you know, I'd been writing this as an open source project for about 15 years, all by myself, uh, a team of one, very autonomous. Uh, and when I started the company, of course, we got in a bunch of developers straight from university, and they're all indoctrinated in the uh, virtues of uh, modularity and using modern methods and APIs. And you know, all of the modern languages have a particular way of approaching APIs. That you set up a context, and then you call the initializer, and there's, a, there's an iterator, you know, all this stuff. And I didn't really have that kind of stuff because my code was, went back to 1993, and it's you know, followed those patterns. So these guys come in, and they took my two header files and 100 source code files, and they said, this is hopeless. A tangled, monolithic mass of spaghetti code. You know, all the, the usual words. I said, OK, fine. Modularize the hell out of it. Good luck. Go for it. And they thought they were going to solve my tangled mess. Now, it turns out that uh, sometimes tangled messes are tangled for a reason, because things actually need to talk to each other in a tangled way. Not everything is clearly separable into independent parts. And so they took this thing and they, they created modules. By brute force, they created these modules. And in the end, we had 100 header files and about the same number of source files. And now, every time we wanted to make a change, we had to search through 100 header files to try and find exactly the right function to include. And every file, instead of having just two header files, had to refer to about 20, 30 header files in order to work. So the overhead of making a small change had suddenly grown to a huge, what used to be a simple task, now is a huge, complex task. So modularity actually carries with it an enormous cost at times, not something we enter into uh, trivially or lightly. This may, be a, this may be heresy in the den of computer science, but I think it's something we have to consider. So separation is useful at times, but it can also be a burden, especially when we try to put components back together again. We can easily uh, develop things alone, but we, it's important to be able to put them back together in any particular way. And this might be a tricky thing. If you, if you remember the, the case of the Mars lander that crashed because there were teams that, uh, that I think it was America and Canada working together, and America measured things in imperial units, and Canada used kilograms, meters per second, as the rest of the world does. Oop. <laughs> Java just interrupted my talk. Remind me later. <laughs> Sorry about that. And we're back. The Mars lander, right. So imperial units and metric units. Uh, unfortunately, they got the units wrong. So when they tried to collaborate and bring these, these two modules together, they got the units wrong. The thing crashed. So clearly, cooperation is something that we have to think uh, rather carefully about. But there must be something right about modularity, because it's everywhere. Um, and a couple of things are, are clearly, um, well, I mean, you know, we see it in, in biology, for example. We have cells, and we have organs, and we have organisms, and we have ecosystems, and we have scales at increasing levels of scale. Um, and they often used to contain particular processes uh, 
so that they don't leak out into the environment. For example, your stomach is used to contain acid. You don't want the acid leaking out everywhere. So you try to contain it using some kind of modular boundary. So there's a couple of things. Obviously, physical separation is something, the ability to stand alone, um, that it's autonomous, to discriminate causation, actually, that we can localize cause, the cause of something like digestion, for example, to a particular module, um, rather than just enveloping something, enveloping your food like an amoeba or a snake. Um, Boundaries can also be barriers to physical propagation, like the, the acid not leaking out and so on. So we often talk about failure domains, but I, I'm not so convinced about that. We'll talk about that in a bit. So there's physical separation. There's also logical separation. Again, autonomy. Specialization, the ability to specialize something in a particular module allows you to focus all your resources on that particular task and make it very, very good. So we become carpenters and doctors and lawyers and so on and they're able to focus all of their attention on one thing, um, limited resources. So logical separation is great. So that's kind of how we separate things in space, modules. But there's also another aspect of dynamical systems, which of course is time, as Jonas mentioned yesterday. And time is super important. How we separate time is almost as important as how we separate things in space. In fact, the two are not independent. So events, of course, are localized things in time. Uh, but there are other time scales that we have to think about, and I'm gonna, I want to come back into that. So what I want to argue is that boundaries are not only about protection or functionality. They're also about how we confront scale and trust, actually, in systems and hand off responsibilities to other parts of a system uh, in a trusted way. And this is a social issue, right? This is about collaboration. It's a social issue. It's not a simple issue. Can we trust the whole or can we just trust the parts? We can divide a system up, but will we capture the right properties once we put it back together again? We really have to explicitly coordinate the outcome. And it turns out that this is a vastly compl complicated topic with a lot of different things you could say. I'm gonna say all of them. No, I'm not gonna say all of them, but I'm gonna say as many as I can in the space of an hour. And maybe, you know, when the, the hook pulls me off the stage, there may be some things left, but I'll try to, try to uh, get through it. All right, I do wanna mention uh, a particular perspective on systems that I developed, which is called promise theory. And I think this is something that helps me to understand scaling from the bottom up. And it has these two aspects, the dynamics and the semantics, the quantitative and the qualitative. And the theory started really as a way of trying for me to introduce uncertainty, to model uncertainty in systems. Also something Jonas talked about yesterday. A simple way to understand influence in a system uh, is to break it down into parts, these atomic parts, just like we do with chemistry. You know, where there are certain basic elements that can make up a, uh, a system. So we have this sort of semantic chemistry chemistry of cooperation, I call it. So we identify these modular atoms or these, these elemental pieces, and then we try to figure out how to put them back together again. And the idea is that when you document the promises that these elements have to make to one another to cooperate, you've, you achieve quite a full documentation of how the system works. And so this contributes also to our knowledge of the system. Remember, scaling and knowledge. I once drew this picture on the board, a whiteboard at, uh, at Cisco, I think it was, um, when I was trying to explain promise theory. And it was really to try to explain the difference between command and control and the idea of promises or autonomous service-like behavior. And of course, command and control is this sort of fist that comes in like Captain Picard, make it so. You know, you will do this. I impose my will onto you. And this is quite... Um, a risky way of managing systems. Of course, it's possible. It's probably the most uh, familiar way of uh, making systems that we have. But it's also quite risky because there can be collisions of causation. Go left, go right. How do you resolve this if the, the intent is coming from outside? And then there's the opposite of that, which is to say, well, look what I can do. Take it or leave it. This is what I can do. Use me if you can which is what happens in chemistry. I'm a hydrogen atom, I have these chemical properties. I'm gold, I'm silver, whatever. So this is a way of um, reorganizing uh, the way we think about systems from 
uh, an outside perspective to an interior perspective, promising from the inside, promising from within the properties of a system. Because, of course, it's the interior of a system that knows what it can do best. So on the surface, promise theory suggests superficial things like, you know, do, do pull, pull, not push, and uh, um, we'll come back to that perhaps, but uh, it also reveals a surprise, and that is that a lot of the properties we think we understand very well are simply figments of scale. We, we believe there's a difference between synchronous or asynchronous or push and pull, but in fact, these things are just scale, scaled versions of each other. So there are two key concepts in promises, as shown on the other slide. I call them imposition and promises. And imposition is this, you know, this fist where you basically throw a ball to someone and say, catch. And this can fail because you know, the, the recipient may be unwilling or unable to comply. Just nope, or actually fast asleep on the job. And then there's the promised view, which is more predictable somehow, and that you have basically promised in advance that you are going to be throwing a ball, and the recipient can prepare themselves, and they can promise in return that they're going to accept or that they're not going to accept. And now you have some chance of understanding being prepared and being able to deal with the situation um, more, uh, more predictably. If, I don't want to say deterministically because it's not true. Because as Jonas pointed out yesterday, either of these promises may not be kept for whatever reason. So there are basics, basic elements of promise theory very quickly are uh, that an agent can only promise its own behaviors from within. Look what I can do. It may choose to take those behaviors from somebody else's lead, so act as a proxy for somebody else's intent. But just as a machine, of course, has no self-will, just no free will, but it can represent the free will of its creator. Second is that imposition is rarely an effective um, um, strategy. The third is that both giver and receiver have promises to give. There's a, a promise to give and there has to be a corresponding promise to receive in order for something to get transferred. In order for intent to propagate through a system, we both have to promise it, promise to deliver it as a service, if you like, and promise to accept that service. Every agent then assesses the other agent's performance in this. Did it keep its promise? It may not have been able to, again, for whatever reason, we don't need to speculate, but it may or may not be able to keep its promise. And what does that mean to me? How does that affect me? So dependency on other agents' promises may lead to failures, may invalidate a promise. And these are important uh, ways of understanding the graph of influence in a network. What I liked about the reactive manifesto um, is that it's a list of promises. It's not a description of, you know, you, you should write these modules or you should write this structure, this kind of code. It's a, it's a number of promises that systems should try to ex exhibit in order to have good behavior. So now to the more important question, can we scale promises? So it's one thing to make a promise as a single agent, but can we scale them when we cooperate? So can a whole bunch of small modules working together deliver on the final promise like the Mars lander couldn't. And this is uh, about how we put boundaries around things. So we talk about black boxes, right? We talk about uh, white boxes or black boxes in which we encapsulate a, a, a set of systems. And on the inside of this boundary, we can talk about the interior promises, the cooperative promises on the inside. And then on the exterior of this box, we can talk about the exterior promises or what this black box promises to do for you for the rest of the world. And there are plenty of different ways to do this. In uh, promise theory, we call this a super agent. It's a cluster of agents. And it basically draws a new boundary around these, this collection of independent things. Of course, it's not really a box. It's a number of agents, like a, a molecule is a bunch of atoms. It reaches out into space and has a, a fairly, you know, the structure of this boundary might not be a simple wall. It might it might be touching a container on one cloud system. It might have a finger in Tokyo. It might have a, a finger in Paris. But it nevertheless reaches out as some sort of network overlaid on top of 
at the top of the world. And then we can see, say, can we see inside, and when do we need to see inside? So transparency is related to what we mean by the coupling of the system to, to its environment. Is there weak coupling or strong coupling? Do we need to see inside in order to, to interact with it? That's strong coupling. If we don't need to know really how, how it works on the inside, that's weak coupling. This turns out to have important properties because strong, strongly coupled systems can clearly break more easily. If we depend on the precise configuration on the inside of something, a failure or a change in that can propagate to the outside through that dependency. Okay, so that's my little preamble. Now let's get to the business in hand, to microservices and monoliths. So this is a real monolith from my hometown in Oslo. Monolith, of course, means big stone or singular stone. And uh, we've used this sort of notion of a, a big giant monolith to, to, sig to sort of to make fun, if you like, of a particular kind of programming, which is partly fair and partly not fair. Uh, so microservices almost came into prominence by throwing stones at this, this notion of a monolith. Um, but what I think this picture illustrates is that monolithicity, if that's a, a word, is the property of being a monolith is related to um, symbolism. We use a monolith to symbolize something. Everything that we think of as symbolic is sort of monolithic. And that's an important thing to, to bear in mind. So let me make a deliberate parody of a software service as a kind of a monolith. And now I'm coming back to this city view. You know, cities were built with walls around them for defensive purposes. And you all recognize this picture from your days of castle sieges. I'm sure you've all uh, attacked a castle in your past. What we see is um, a service castle with a bunch of clients coming for a good fight around it. And these, these events are streaming in as these armies um, and from a distance, you know, the castle looks like a singular monolith. And from the castle's perspective, in the distance, the army looks like this monolithic army, this, this mass of, uh, this swarm of, of, of people coming towards it. As we get closer, as they start to see the whites of their eyes, of each other's eyes, they realize that there's some internal structure. In the castle, actually, there's a bunch of collaborating servers on the inside, firing arrows at them. And on the outside, the, the army attacking is actually composed of a number of attacking axes or whatever. And in classic computer science way, we said, OK, this looks like an impossible task, but we can do it one by one, arrow for arrow. We can uh, simply scale this uh, one arrow at a time, serializing the queues appropriately. So our entire perspective on the this problem changes depending on how far away from it we're, we're looking or how high above the system we are looking. So first of all, the interactions. From a distance, the castle appears to be pretty singular. Similarly, time. Uh, it looks like you have an event that there's an attack on a castle. Done. It's an event. But as we break it down into smaller pieces, we find that there are arrows going backwards and forth. There's a detailed picture going on. In physics, we call this a detailed balance condition. So while they're sort of facing each other off, there's one arrow killing one person. Da, 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 da. We handle it one arrow at a time. It's a situation of detailed balance. And then there are promises. So this, from a distance, the castle looks like an impregnable thing. It's, it promises to resist intrusions. Uh, and it's also, as we get closer, we see the servers on the outside promise to handle transactions with the attacking orcs or ghouls or whatever they are. Um, and so the scaling of this problem is, in fact, looks very monolithic from the outside. But as we get closer, we realize there's a lot of parallelization on the inside. Interestingly, as a side note, there was a physicist uh, after the Second World War. He was a conscientious objector after the Second World War. And he became obsessed with the notion of understanding warfare and conflict. And he, he speculated that between any two countries that has a boundary, the number of conflicts between the two countries may be proportional to the length of the boundary. 
And he tried very hard to therefore measure the lengths, to verify this with data, and measure the lengths of the, the boundaries of, between countries. And what he found was that because of scale, as he looked at these countries in closer and closer detail, the longer the, 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 the boundary seemed to be. This was rediscovered years later by Benoit Mandelbrot, as you know, as fractals, the length of a coastline, the length of a border. The closer you look, the longer it is. And the same is true in systems. The closer we look, the more details we see, the more details we have to cope with. What that has ended up showing in physics is that we can extract very universal properties of systems and interactions based on the dimensionality of the boundaries between systems. How complex are the boundaries between them? How many dimensions do they have? Is it a one-dimensional boundary, like in a queue? Is there someone standing in front of me? Or is it a two-dimensional boundary, like a ring around the castle? Or is it a three-dimensional boundary, like filling space, like a Wi-Fi signal, or uh, an IoT, Internet of Things, embedded systems in, in three-dimensional space? What is the dimensionality and the complexity of that boundary? That has a strong influence on the way systems interact with their environments. So at small scale, we have a study in detailed balance that affects the way we write systems. Each tick of the clock is an arrow fired or an ax killing somebody or hopefully not killing somebody. And at the large scale, we see these sort of invariant equilibria, these sort of balance conditions where things seem to be much more stable. So stability, interactions, all this stuff is very scale dependent. So then monolithicity, what does it mean for us? Depending on how we draw boundaries, software systems may appear to be monolithic or not. And often we think of that things are monolithic because we only think about the code part. You know, we, we somehow think that it's only the code we write, which is the system. But it's not, right? It's the developers are part of the system. They're changing it all the time. The users, of course, are part of the system. <laughs> we better not forget the users. And of course, the tests that we write are often a totally separate subsystem interacting and you see three cognitive relationships in this picture, centralized by this kind of switch, which is the code. The code unifies these three interactions, one between developers and code, one between tests and code, and the other between users and code. Therefore, there are multiple concerns, three distinct cognitive relationships. By cognitive, I mean something that interacts remembers some influence based on the interaction, has a memory of the interaction, the code was changed, the state changed, whatever. And the way we choose to scale the system depends very much on these relationships and the kinds of um, limitations that the different agents have with respect to one another. So these, at this level of detailed balance, the efficiency of the, the changes or the learning of the system or the adaptation of the system over time through software development or through state changing or through automation or whatever, whatever the reason, this depends upon the way we organize the modules in the system. But does it matter if we create a, a particular program structure as modules or something that's very sort of tangled? Does it matter if we replace a PCI bus with Ethernet? Does it matter if we, if we run something on a single host or on a collection of hosts in a cloud? Is that the point of, of, of services and monoliths? I think not. Although Ethernet may be a lot faster than PCI bus, it doesn't mean to say that the system is going to perform better because the system is constrained by its three, these three relationships. And we have to figure out exactly who we're trying to optimize for. Now, um, to scale, I just want to make sidestep briefly to talk about scaling by imposition. Promises, impositions. Um, suppose we set up a checkpoint in the battlefield so that as these invading armies are coming in, we say, I say, would you guys manage, please mind going to the castle over there because we're a bit busy here. Or, you know, you uh, goblins, you take the ladder on the left and you other guys take the ladder on the right. 
and, and please balance nicely so that we can handle your, you have a much better fight experience if you, if you follow this. And this, of course, is what we do with load balances, which are one of the most ridiculous inventions the IT industry ever came up with, which have been perpetuated in, even, in, even in the cloud. Because, of course, we, we send all of this stuff by imposition towards, um, towards the, the monolith, if you like, the, the system, and to one of these blue boxes. And then we say, OK, we can't handle it, so we'll set up some more blue boxes. So we need a green box to send to, to spray the traffic, basically, onto this, uh, this array of systems. And it's literally just spraying the traffic onto these things without much um, thought. But then, OK, this is not resilient. We've got a single point of failure. We need to scale that. So we add another green box. And now we have to ask, so which of the green boxes am I supposed to go to to be sprayed onto the blue boxes? So we introduce a red box. And which of the red boxes do I have to go to, to to go to the green box, to go to the blue box, and on and on and on. And if we follow the sort of the natural uh, pattern of resilience and non-single points of failure and horizontal scaling, what happens is we end up pushing the responsibility for choosing all the way back to the client again, who should have simply chosen in the first place, because the best way to scale a system of interactions in horizontally is, of course, to simply provide the information as to where um, the best fight experience is happening. And if you've been to Heathrow Airport, you, you know where the best uh, fight experiences happen. But this is, the, this is essentially the way we scale CDN, right? Using DNS. You know, it's, DNS is a horribly aged, primitive technology, but it still kind of just does the job. We could easily replace it with something better, but it's still, nevertheless, does the right kind of job um, for, for scaling. So I suppose what I'm trying to say is that monolithicity, that's a good word, is really a figment of scale. And simply keeping something small doesn't a service make. So this notion of microservices versus uh, monolith is not a very clear-cut thing. It's a scale-dependent issue. Think of a brain. Our brains are tangled networks of microscopic services called neurons. But as we scale up, it looks like a blob, a centralized blob. Is it decentralized or centralized? Depends on the scale. If you look at Chinatown in any country of the world, but this is Hong Kong, it looks like a tangled mess of of all kinds of stuff going on. Who could possibly understand it? But if you scale out, it just, it's just an island. And if you scale out of planet Earth with all of its ecosystems, it's just a ball. So these things are slightly uh, illusory. And the key thing we need to ask is that at what scale do particular promises get kept? Can we keep the same promises as we scale a system? or? Do, does the nature of a system change qualitatively and quantitatively as we scale the system up by necessity? Just sticking a load balancer in probably isn't going to keep it as the same kind of system. Another side note, uh, you know, the popular management belief in the superiority of teams always kind of annoyed me because, you know, I'm a pathologically antisocial misanthropic introvert, which means I hate people. <laughs> so I, I always prefer to innovate on my own. Sit in, you know, I've been reading. I've been gathering data by sequential reading, by talking. You know, the few times I, I want to talk to somebody, I gather, it's stored in my brain. I have a memory. Any system that has memory doesn't need to stand in front of a whiteboard in some microservice fest, uh, talking and bouncing ideas off each other like some pinball game, you can just sit quietly and do that in your head. And there's a huge network in your head, way bigger than the, you know, a little team, a two-pizza team. So this idea that uh, teams are intrinsically better than people at innovating, to me, is just simple nonsense. The, 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 the numbers don't add up, so to speak. So extroverts, you, if any, any extroverts around, shout out if you're an extrovert. Fail. <laughs> you know, 
may get some emotional boost, some, um, some sense of inclusiveness or whatever, some warm cuddles from this interaction, but I don't think it actually helps the innovation. Okay, so finally, finally, microservices story. So what if we reorganize these uh, interactions, these cognitive relationships, so that instead of being separated through these boundaries of users, code, uh, tests, as totally independent things, we, we shrink wrap them differently. Like when you go to the supermarket and they sell you like a box of cookies and each one is individually wrapped and then it's wrapped in another box and then the three, three boxes are wrapped in a big box, a super box. We can just reorganize the wrapping to make a variety pack. And that's kind of what microservices are. So my friend uh, Adrian Cockroft, who, who talked a lot about this around the experiences at Netflix, made this important point that um, the point of microservices is to optimize one of these cognitive relationships, the one that is somehow the weakest one, which is the human cognitive experience. And if you guys heard of Robin Dunbar, the, the, he's a British psychologist who came up with the notion of the Dunbar number. It's this idea that the human brain, actually all, all primate brains are scale in size according to the number of relationships that we can maintain. Not the amount of data we can process or the, 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 um, the amount of things we can remember, but the, the number of processes that we can engage in so a relationship is an ongoing process, more than just an event, but an ongoing session, if you like, between you and a friend. And it's this notion of revisiting an interaction over time and interacting on a regular basis that builds continuity, trust. We learn knowledge. We memorize the behavioral aspects of systems and we learn to adapt to them. That's a cognitive system. And it's that adaptation, which is the notion of um, uh, trust. That's why we trust things when we, we understand how they behave. Do they keep their promises or not? And this is limited by the dimensionality of the scaling boundaries. So what if we reorganize teams so that the developers sit very closely to a small modular piece that they can sort of fit inside their head, you know, try and compress it and try and feed it in one ear or something. If you can understand the entire module by yourself, um, then somehow this is, allows you to have a close relationship to this module, understand it much better, and you imagine that this would make bug fixing uh, uh, and so on much more efficient. So that was, that was kind of the idea. It may be slower in operational terms, no matter. We've, we've solved one cognitive problem, which is how to scale the human organization. Now, of course, in some level, this is a bit of a cop-out because, uh, yes, of course, it's so much easier to work on one single piece of code and you make your change and you feel good about it. We did this for a good reason. We're all, all happy within our, in our little team. But you may have totally screwed all the other modules in, in the system who need to rely on you by making a change. So you may have caused a massive fault propagation event by making, say, a change in your API or a change in the performance of your system. So there is no sense in which a, a microservice is a fault domain. They don't contain faults at all. Boundaries, modules don't contain faults. As soon as you connect it to something else, those faults will propagate. Moreover, there may be faults through totally hidden dependencies. And the hidden dependencies are always the ones that we introduce invisibly as platforms to share certain properties, to, so to, to allow sharing. So DNS, of course, is the, always the biggest failure domain. It's always a DNS problem. GitHub, even as a failure domain, uh, what am I saying? Not a failure domain. GitHub is a dependency, I'm sorry, which can easily be used to propagate errors from one module to another. If you, both, if you all rely on the same bit of code, remember that Java, uh, sorry, Node.js story of the white space stripping module was withdrawn, broke like 6,000 packages or something. Yep, GitHub can break your, your system. Even a monitoring system may seem unintrusive, 
but it may require resources of your system and therefore impinge upon it. We have this nice story about containers as being uh, separatable things that somehow contain failures. But if one failure, sorry, if one container goes down, it could bring down the kernel. The kernel could bring down all the containers. There are these platform dependencies that are somehow invisible that we use for a particular reason, which is economics of scale. I'll come back to that. Which intrinsically link together these separate modules in ways that we don't imagine. So actually, our nicely separate modular system is a tangled mess after all. And it's a tangled mess because of this problem, which is economies of scale. We're always trying to optimize uh, different things. And this is an important lesson, I think, about the dimensionality of the boundary again. We claim that horizontal scaling is good, but vertical scaling is always cheaper, right? If you have to introduce the overhead of switching between servers, that's an overhead. It costs more. It's simply slower. If you have to wait for a failover, that's slower than fixing a system rapidly. If you have to go to more than one location to buy your groceries, it's less efficient than just going to a supermarket and getting them all in the same place. This is the idea of economies of scale. If we can aggregate things in a single location at a single server, we can utilize its capacity at a much higher level. Less cost, less overheads, but somehow heresy because it breaks with the idea of modularity. The way we get around that is to say, well, this is related to the commoditization of things. If we can make everything look quite similar, then we can easily aggregate them without causing too much damage. And we can use the same semantic boundaries, the same modules to handle them in the same kind of way. Uh, and we can make that very efficient without sort of muddling together concerns, if you like, uh, too much. So um, this, of course, is exactly the argument for cloud computing that AWS came up with. How many containers or VMs can we squeeze into a physical server in order to utilize the capacity at a higher level? And then can we contain on the interior of these black boxes uh, the promises that they make for particular jobs? And on the exterior, they all look pretty much the same so that the cloud can handle them in the same way. So then we, we achieve the, some kind of economy of scale um, in that way. This all sounds very nice, um, but it, it tells us that we have to sort of take away the monolithicity of things. We have to make everything look the same, but we have to take away the labels that make things special in order to handle them in bulk. Just like commodities, you know, your cornflakes or whatever. There isn't like multicolored cornflakes that you have to go to a special shop for red cornflakes or green cornflakes. These things all lump together into a single choice because it's cheaper to scale. Another example of this, which I like very much, is which, which really describes to us um, this issue about what goes on on the inside of, of modules is uh, the, an experiment that was done during the 60s and 70s in town planning called the Garden City Movement. Again, cities are sort of the future of uh, IT systems, the future of code. And uh, this is a South American experiment. This, uh, Brasilia was one of the, the key examples of this, where they tried to separate the modular functions of the city in different areas connected together by roads. So they had these beautiful gardens, lots of green space, they had a residential part of town, central business district, uh, factories, um, parking, shopping, and so on. And what they found was that when they scaled, when they tried to scale the system, they found that everyone was just stuck in traffic because everyone's trying to get from home to work at the same time. Everyone's going shopping at the same time. They, didn't, they weren't able to balance the load or the traffic flows between these modules in an efficient way because everyone was trying to do the same thing in a coherent way instead of in a totally messed up way. And I have this little picture of Hong Kong back there in the corner there to remind you, what a, think of what a mess 
any sort of Chinatown is, and think of how successful every Chinatown is as an economic area. Successful resource sharing environments are messy because they're close together, they're tightly packed, they are tangled spaghetti code. That's efficient. The modularity is not efficient, not dynamically efficient. It might be cognitively efficient. It might help us to keep some sort of mental hygiene. It might make it easier for developers to understand what's their design principles. But dynamically, it's the messy, tangled spaghetti code that can be most efficient because it's able to utilize space and time efficiently. So this is the huge revelation that I think uh, that we're missing in, in and trying somehow to capture through cloud and through platform technologies that perform a lot of the sharing for us. But if we really understood how to scale systems efficiently, we would possibly be less, well, we need to find a good answer to this, this issue of modularity, balancing cognitive issues against dynamical issues. The other thing that we do, of course, is to create rigid hierarchies um, on the inside and on the outside of systems. So this is just a very quick uh, example to show that the way we order things in hierarchies is far from clear. Every time we try to, to come up with a static data model to represent a hierarchy, we get it wrong. A company can, is composed of a number of branches in different countries, or a country contains many different companies, which is right. They're both right. This is just part of a larger semantic graph, a network that connects concepts together and can be addressed by passing this graph through a number of different routes. And these different routes are just spanning trees through this generalized network. So every time you see a class hierarchy, every time you see a, a functional decomposition of something, bear in mind, this is not an intrinsic solution to a problem. This is simply one possible spanning tree through the set of possible solutions to this problem. There may be others with different optimizations in different contexts. Our ability to represent different contexts is a huge challenge as we, in, as we reach systems that have, are increasingly outward facing, user facing, embedded systems, touching users, touching the real world, measuring the environment, all of these influences impinging on the systems like weather, select certain different kinds of optimizations depending on what we're doing. Super important. So how do we apply these ideas? Scaling tells us we need to think carefully about space and time when making promises, semantic and dynamic concerns. With a nuanced view of promises, we have a dilemma. What and whom should we optimize for? Microservices tend to optimize for human limitations. Cloud tries to optimize for energy consumption, basically. So the main problems with components is we're locked into this finite sort of worldview. Some years ago, I worked on a project at Cisco, actually, we were working on an IoT project. And the idea is to embed you know, a lot of devices touching users at the endpoints of a system and then manage them somehow. And initially the idea was, you know, these big network companies always want to centralize everything. They have the network, they'll just grab everything, big data into the cloud. We pretty, much, pretty soon figured out that we needed to distribute these systems and handle the computation at the edge. Because there's no point actually in sending data all the way halfway across the world if you don't need to. So if you can eliminate, reduce, signal, separate signal from noise at the edge of a system before aggregating it and, and understanding the, the composition of those modular pieces, um, you can uh, save quite a lot of resources on that. Um, so instead of sort of a, a permanent barrier, we, we tried to create this platform to invite collaboration and ended up with a kind of clustered view of container clustered view, which could have probably, it was about this, the time the Kubernetes was coming out. And I speculated that perhaps we could implement one of these IoT clusters with Kubernetes. Because you know, in the future, cloud and IoT will just be the same thing. We won't be 
consolidating everything in these massive data centers. There'll still be consolidation of some jobs in data centers, but there is so much potential to compute at the edge of the cloud and no need to centralize everything to begin with um, because that just causes channels, you know, bad channel separation. So the, the cognitive aspect of modularity we need to preserve by leaving the computations at the edge and then just bringing together things that are important like whether your Mars probe can integrate its uh, promises together. And this is a concept of workspaces. It uh, became an IRTF draft uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, never actually implemented, but I think sort of kind of an interesting thing. And then speaking of Kubernetes, now of course this is a popular way to, to deploy services, but it suffers from this issue that as we have modularized the, the workloads, these containers, we've now created a barrier which is somewhat opaque. We're not supposed to be able to see inside containers. And this becomes an issue when we're trying to understand the behavioral promises that these containers make. Can we understand why uh, a container is not keeping its promises or why the integration of these things is not proceeding as expected? Um, so there's this conflict of interest between entropy or forgetting information, not, not distinguishing between things, and having too much information about what's going on inside. This again relates to the trust issue. So, you know, a lot of technology being built today, and here, is a, here are a few projects, um, all of them wrestling with these dilemmas about what's on the interior of a boundary and what's on the exterior of a boundary. How much should we share? How much should we expose? And how much time will we waste by processing information that we don't need to see? I've been uh, fortunate to work on a project now with IBM where we've been working on um, instrumenting these cloud container systems. And some of you, have you heard of Istio? Istio is like um, this nice sort of layer seven cloud um, a monitoring sidecar system where you can instrument containers with uh, uh, these sidecars that can pull out metrics and observe them and integrate these pictures and really be able to look inside these uh, otherwise closed containers, break them apart, inject faults and do the testing. And if you think about those, those three cognitive processes surrounded by the code, we're now able to do the testing on both the dynamic and the semantic level by injecting semantic faults or in, by injecting particular semantic viewpoints into a system and then learning, applying machine learning. There's, uh, this old project of mine, Solibrium, is, applies some machine learning techniques and cognitive reasoning, artificial reasoning techniques to try to integrate a picture from these separate modular pieces. But not, not sending just all the information into a single lump and trying to churn through it as big data, but at each stage using boundaries to filter only meaningful signal from noise so that we can understand the context in which signals were created. Because without context, we really cannot understand the full behavior, semantic and dynamic behavior of a system. So these twin learning cycles that we should always keep in mind there's the experiential stuff, the evidence-based stuff, and the approximations we make to that. And then there's this intent, what we hoped a system would do, the code, the policy, and so on. Someone invented this pejorative monolith to ridicule the notion of scaling. But what does that mean to us on a scale beyond just simple IT? As we head into this age of smart cities, countries, districts, buildings, services, even money. There are all of these social processes, these network processes that, are, um, that we need to understand. The true purpose of a monolith is to be simple and comprehensible, to be that symbolic totem, that, that uh, obelisk like the Washington Monument or this uh, 101 tower in Shenzhen in China. And we need to figure out which relationship it is we, op we optimize for. As humans interact with the system, it's always us. We, we place ourselves in the system, and we, we imagine that the system behaves like us because we're so used to 
you know, reaching out with our limbs and touching things with our hands, we think command and control because that's how we operate ourselves. And we think of technology as an extension of ourselves. And so we go through a, a phase when we're building technologies that we build tools to help ourselves that look somewhat like us. On the left-hand side, we, we create these sort of monolithic technologies that imitate command and control. And they scale in a very monolithic way, not too well. They give us some kind of super strength, like a, a super suit to wear. But then, as we rethink and, and adapt and manage to write ourselves out of the narrative, we figure out how to coax space itself to keep the promises that we were trying to keep manually ourselves and get every element of space and time to keep that promise for us. So we end up with something that looks like a data center for growing plants, a hydroponics farm. We've transformed space-time, if you want, into a factory by commoditizing, by removing labels, by making all of these independent locations similar and creating a kind of a cloud for agriculture. Another example is how we deal with garbage collection, storage. Storage, garbage collection, basically the same thing. We start out thinking, OK, we've got a flood. How do we handle this? Men come with tools. Yes, we will create a giant, uh, a giant uh, monolith to suck up the water like Superman. And then someone comes up with the idea, well, why don't we just adapt space-time to suck away water automatically in a scalable way, a distributed microservice approach, if you like. Much easier, totally without human intervention. So as we scale these issues, we, we, we struggle with this dichotomy between wanting to uh, have individuality, symbolic understanding, and this idea to have shared anonymous behaviors that uh, are easy to trust in the sense that they scale well, but they're not easy to trust because we don't see so easily how they work. They're harder to understand, perhaps. Joseph Tainter was a, an anthropologist. He studied the collapse of civilizations. And some of you may recognize this, uh, this curve from his book. It looks pretty much like Gunther's scaling law. His idea about why various civilizations through time collapsed was because they modularized. As they grew in sophistication, they wanted to specialize certain functions. Carpenters, metal metallurgists, government, police, whatever. And they became so specialized that they began to develop their own language into, on the interior of these, these boundaries. And when they wanted to talk to each other, they no longer took, talked so much to each other, so they didn't trust each other so much. So Chinatown became this garden city. And every time they wanted to visit each other or talk to each other, they'd like have to, yeah, you can make an appointment. So if you fill out this form and triplicate, yeah, you can come and see me on Tuesday. Because now trust is, you know. And this is what we do when we make modules when we make organizational barriers, departments, we no longer trust each other. We no longer have those casual conversations. We erect barriers, and it becomes inefficient. The cost of modularization has one header file per department. It becomes expensive. And eventually, this expense chokes civilization. And it becomes too expensive, and it just falls apart. This was his, his view, totally independent of IT, but a, a nice counterexample. So, modules and boundaries don't exist in a vacuum. The way we choose modules implies a particular perspective from which it might be hard to escape. Reactive adaptation is a cognitive process which pushes slowly at the envelope of invariant things in the system, the invariances. It's not a transactional issue. It's about what is invariant or persistent in a system. So we should ask, do our module choices reflect the cognitive invariance of our system? Because if they don't, we risk having weaknesses. If we're trying to build consensus on things that are varying all the time, you know, consensus is expensive, like Joseph Tainter's 
uh, or Gunther's scaling law. Even in this talk, you know, I tried to come up with a modular approach just to be smart or pretend to be smart. But those modules, if you can find them at all, are totally lost in the narrative of the story that I'm trying to tell you from end to end. And we should always remember, although modules might be convenient for us as, as the builders of a system, it's the end-to-end -end experience that we're really trying to create. That's the business purpose. That's the outcome we're trying to engineer. And so modularity should be of secondary nature to that experience and the way that we scale it. Boundaries may help us or hinder us in managing uh, networks. Dynamical and somatic resources are taking an increasing variety of forms, containers, unikernels, microservices, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and these cognitive relationships that I mentioned are something we tend to forget because we're so used to them. We, we are part of them, and the users are part of them. But we should bear in mind that those are the things that have severe resource limitations because cognitive things are expensive in memory and in time. So as we look at boundaries, we need to sort of really be asking, uh, are we looking inwards or are we looking outwards and with respect to which boundary? If you want to read more about this, I have some bounded um, text on these topics. Uh, the one with the sort of finger of God pointing down at is, I would recommend to you. That's the one that Kiki was kind enough to uh, recommend to you. These are sort of in order of increasing incomprehensibility. So start by all means from the left and uh, work towards the right. The right is still a work in progress and the link that I showed you here is, is a link to that so it's all free. Uh, you're welcome to look at it and even comment on it, and I'd be happy to hear your feedback, and also I would be happy to take your questions. So thank you for your attention this morning, and I hope you have a great conference. <laughs>